Thank you very much. Good morning. It's great to see you today. It's good to have you with us. And if you're online, we're glad, glad you're here too. I'm going to ask we all stand as we sing our opening song. Praise him, praise him. Jesus, our blessed redeemer, followed by we're marching to Zion. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed redeemer. Sing, oh, earth, his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor, give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children in heaven. our blessed Redeemer, heavenly portals loud with hosannas ring, Jesus Savior reigneth forever and ever, crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king, Christ is coming over the world victorious, power and glory. Excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. I apologize. Let's try that second part. Come, we that love the Lord, and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus around the throne, and thus around the throne, we're marching to Zion. Beautiful Zion, we're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Then let our songs abound. Marching through Emmanuel's ground To fairer worlds on high To fairer worlds on high We're marching to Zion Beautiful, beautiful Zion We're marching up to Zion The beautiful city of God Thank you. Good morning. Good to see y'all this morning. Great day to be in the house of the Lord. Several announcements as we get started this morning, so if I could have your attention for just a minute. Children's church will begin today, so when we hear Pastor Doug call for all the children to go to children's church, all of you who are children, come on back to children's church. And then as you came in this morning, you probably noticed the Operation uh, Christmas Child shoe boxes out there. It is time for that again, and uh, if, if you would like to help with that, Grab a shoe box and fill it up. Or if you don't want to do the shopping, uh, Susie has volunteered to spend your money for you. So just leave $20 here, make it out to the church, or designate it to the Operation Christmas Child, and Susie will spend that money for you. We've started back our Wednesdays at the Grove. We, this past Wednesday, uh, we met up here at the Pavilion, and so we're going to be doing that until, I don't know when the end date is, but probably through October, Dan says, so... Uh, that's at 6 p.m. on Wednesday evenings up here at the pavilion. And this coming Saturday, we're going to have uh, an apple seed shooting event. This will be the second one. That's this Saturday. And if you haven't registered, you can go to appleseedinfo.org and register for that. And then uh, uh, the last Saturday, which is September the 26th, we're going to have a brotherhood breakfast this month. We haven't had one of those for a while. So that's going to be Saturday. The 26th is going to be at 8.30 a.m., and we're going to have that at the pavilion this time. So men, uh, be mindful of that. And ladies, 
We're not leaving you out on the 30th, which is the last Wednesday. Uh, there's going to be a ladies' luncheon at 11.30 at the new El Rey's restaurant next to Wendy's. So don't go to the old one. Go to the new one. It's next to Win Wendy's, and it's going to be the 30th at 11.30. And this evening, if you're a new uh, leader in one of the committees, the administration or the ministry committee, there's training from 4.30 to 5. And then following that is an administration committee meeting at 5 o'clock. Good to be with y'all this morning. Well, good morning. So glad to see you here in God's house today. It's a joy to be able to worship the Lord together, and I appreciate you making the effort to be here and worship with us. Appreciate those of you who are joining us online as well. Um, if you're here for the very first time, we welcome you on the back of the pew in front of you. There should be a card there. Take it out, fill it out, and on your way out later, drop it in the offering plate so that we'll have a record of your time with us today, but we are glad to have you to be a part of this. One thing that I did want to point out for those of you who are interested in our church or maybe have recently joined, this is kind of a new members or interested in Pleasant Grove Baptist, we call it Discovery Class. It'll be October the 4th, which is the first Sunday in October. It'll be 3 o'clock that afternoon. So there's a sign-up sheet out here. If you'd like to be a part of that, please be sure to sign up and let us know that you'll be able to participate in that. But we are very glad you're here, and we just want to ask God to prepare our hearts to be in his presence today. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, what a blessing it is to be in your house today. God, we just come before you now realizing our total dependence upon you. God, we just ask you to work in our hearts right now. Reveal anything in our hearts, any hardness, any unconfessed sin, Lord, that we need to lay at your feet so that we can be in your presence today. We don't want to do anything to hinder your movement among us. Lord, I pray for those who may be in here today or watching online that don't yet know you. I pray you'd stir their hearts. Something that's saying or something that is said, God would move in them and your Holy Spirit would draw them to you. Whatever you need to do in our hearts, whatever you need to do in this place, God, we surrender ourselves to you now. So have your way in us. It's in your powerful and precious name we pray these things. Amen. Gail Jordan's going to come and share a, a wonderful song about our Lord, and it's called They Could Not. Good morning. up 
they really understand they could alive. They couldn't keep him. Keep him in that grave. Amen. Uh, we're going to share a song together. I'm going to ask you to join as we sing together, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Let's all stand as we sing together.
grace that we've received from the Lord, and because that we're redeemed, we're going to sing about that right now, redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, let's join together as we, as we sing, and sing, and sing. Children go to children's church right now. That's not you, Ralph. <laughs> Pre-K through third grade. 
pre-K through third grade. This is our first Sunday back doing it, so we're a little out of practice. It's been about six months. <laughs> now, you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Revelation chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 9 through 20 this morning. Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 through 20. Do you ever feel a little bit overwhelmed by all that's going on around you? I mean, we live in a time right now when it's easy to feel overwhelmed with all the hatred being spewed about and the media that likes to replay it over and over and over and add fuel to the fire. It's no wonder things feel a bit out of control in our culture. The left says they're right, the right says they're right, and the reality is you can't have a different opinion than anybody else. I'm, I'm allowed to believe what I believe as long as it's okay with you. At least that's the culture in which we live. You no longer agree to disagree on something. Apparently, if I disagree with you, then your job is to cancel me out because my opinion doesn't matter because obviously it's an awful opinion because your opinion is the one that is the one that really matters. What a crazy culture we live in. Do you ever have days when you feel like everything's coming at you? feels like that no matter what people are coming at you, it feels like no matter what things are just going wrong, the clock's working against you, all those things, you just feel like things are pressing against you. There are times, honestly, when I want to say, okay, stop the ride for just a minute. I want to get off for just a little bit, just to take a deep breath here. I know there are times when it feels like I can't field one more question, I can't make one more decision. I literally just simply want to say that I'll have to wait till tomorrow. My, my inbox is full today. But it's easy to feel overwhelmed. It's easy to feel overwhelmed in the workplace. The boss is always looking over your shoulder. The other employees aren't cooperative. The customers are always cranky. It makes me think of that old TV commercial, Calgon, take me away. Being overwhelmed is not much fun. However, there is a good sense of being overwhelmed. Those times when we feel the love of God and it really sinks in, just in a glimpse of a moment, how much he genuinely loves us. That feeling of being overwhelmed is a great feeling. <clears throat> For me, it can happen when a great song reminds me of God's love. Uh, the Lord speaks to me through music a lot of times as much as he does through <clears throat> other avenues, through the spoken word. Uh, God just has gifted people to put things in songs that I would love to be able to express myself, but I don't have that talent. But God has given someone else that talent, and I'm grateful for it. There's also joy you feel as a parent when you're overwhelmed by the fact that God has allowed you to be a parent, or the joy you feel when you see that child take their first steps, or ride solo on the bike for the first time, or hit that first home run, or score that first touchdown, or bring home that report card with all A's, or the overwhelming gratitude you feel from God and from that child when the first time that child can look at you and say, I love you. I think in a lot of ways God feels that way when we say I love you to him. As we pick up in the Revelation today, we're going to see that John was overwhelmed in a good way. The privilege he was being afforded by God. You know, he had gotten to walk alongside Jesus and see so many things take place, but now God is giving him the privilege of seeing what is yet to come. Hasn't yet happened, but is yet to come. And I, and I believe we're living in a time when it's so, so very close. But I want us to take a look at what we can learn from our text today and John's sense of overwhelmedness in the midst of this. So Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verse 9, and I'll ask you to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verse 9. I, John, your brother and partner in the affliction, kingdom, and endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard a loud voice behind me like a trumpet, saying, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Then I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. When I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe and with a golden sash wrapped around his chest. The hair of his head was white as wool, white as snow, and his eyes like a fiery flame. His feet were like fine bronze as it is fired in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of cascading waters. He had seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was shining like the sun at full strength. 
When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys to death, keys of death in Hades. Therefore, write what you have seen, what is and what will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. May the Lord add richly to the reading of his word. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you that your word is not a truth, but is the truth. God, open our hearts and minds to hear from you today. God, thank you for giving John a vision of what is yet to come and letting us know that we can know the signs, that we can know the seasons and what's taking place. And remember that even when things seem so overwhelming to us, that you are still in control. You are still on the throne. God, I pray right now that I might decrease, that you might increase. May your truth be spoken here. It's in your powerful and precious name we pray these things. Amen. You may be seated. Now, first of all, I want you to see in this text the author and the audience. The author and the audience. Now, verse 9 begins, we see John identify himself uh, uh, there as uh, in a sense of awe and awareness of the fact that he is your brother and your partner in the affliction. He's receiving this vision from God and reporting this to you. Now, given uh, this, his exile to the island of Patmos, he understood the endurance of that it took place to live for God in a hostile environment. Folks, we're living in a time that is as close to the first century and the second century as ever before, where there is such rampant paganism around us and such wrong, hard attitudes toward the Christian faith. And we are still, as much as there is persecution in the United States, we are still far better off than so many countries around the world who are our brothers and sisters in the faith enduring tremendous persecution. John survived the persecution of Nero and the destruction of the temple of Jerusalem. He's the only one of the apostles left that lived to old age, and yet he doesn't elevate himself above other believers. He identifies himself as a common brother, as one of us, the average Joe, or or John if you prefer. If anyone had the spiritual pedigree to feel a little elevated at this point, John did. And yet that's not the way he presents himself in this. He takes on that humility that those who walk with the Lord truly exhibit. I know in my lifetime, those that I have known that have walked most closely with the Lord, they are always humble. Those who are walking right with the Lord, there will be a humility about them John could have taken on an air of self-importance, but he didn't. He was humble. And what an amazing insight into his heart, even as he addresses the audience that we'll take a look at in just a moment. Now, John tells us that he is on the island of Patmos. And let, let me be clear about here, this island of Patmos was not a comfortable existence. This was not John getting a luxurious stay on an island. This was a hot, rocky island in the Aegean Sea. It was a volcanic island. It was about 10 miles long at its longest point and about 6 miles wide at its widest point. It was about 50 miles or 40 miles rather offshore from Miletus. And according to Roman historian Tacitus, it was common for the Roman government to send exiles to islands like this. It's highly likely that the labor on the island was extremely difficult. It's most likely that there was a Roman guarding him with a, uh, with a whip in hand. So there was a lot going on to take place that made it very uncomfortable. He probably didn't have enough clothing. He probably didn't have enough food. And there was certainly nowhere to bed. So literally when he would lay down to sleep at night, it would be directly on the ground. That's a little different than our existence today. Most of us don't have to worry about a roof over our head or food to eat or a comfortable bed to lay in. John had it rough. John tells us that he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day as he heard this voice behind him. And I like the way John Phillips, in his commentary, deals with this in the Spirit. He says, John understood what it meant to live in this world and in Christ. You see, as as Christians, we are citizens of heaven. 
but we are also sojourners passing through this world. While we should keep our focus on Christ and, and be enthralled with the things of eternity, we, almost, we also should never overlook that which is around us because we are to be a witness to this world. John had a grasp of that. John was fully aware that his strength came from above, but he was also conscious that he needed to do everything he could to honor God in this world. This was John worshiping God, not in some sort of trance. John was focusing on God, and I pray that we'll take time to do that on a daily basis. I know for me personally, it's real easy for me to become mechanical and sort of, I'm a task-oriented person, so I like to check the things off my list and get them done. But when it comes to worshiping God, we've got to pause and really focus our attention upon Him, and it shouldn't be something that we just check off our list. Now, the Lord's Day is viewed by some here in this text as the day of God's judgment. But the Greek here is not that terminology. It's not the, the phrase for day of the Lord. The matter, matter of fact, the Greek used here is only used here this one time in the New, in the New Testament, and it's best translated the Lord's day. They, therefore, it makes more sense to understand this in terms of it being Sunday. By the second century, the Lord's day came to refer to Sunday, and literally we're just a few years from the second century as John is relaying this, so it makes the most sense to understand it in that way. It is best to understand this full phrase as John was worshiping God on Sunday. And I'm certain that given John's life and circumstances, he worshiped God every day, but he gave us this information to give clarity as to what day and what was going on when this took place. So a lot of that to say the author of this revelation was John, and he received this on Sunday, and it was from Jesus, but we'll cover that part a little more in a moment. John doesn't give us the author doesn't just give us the author here himself hearing this from God. He gives us the audience as well. The main audience for the revelation, I'm afraid, is not us. You do realize the United States did not exist <laughs> when the revelation was given to John. The main audience was the churches of Asia Minor, the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These churches were located in Asia Minor, which today would be modern-day Turkey. And John MacArthur's commentary on this text, he says of this, These seven churches were chosen because they were located in the key cities of the seven postal districts into which Asia was divided. They were thus the central points for disseminating information. The seven cities appear in order that a messenger traveling on the great circular road that linked them would visit them. After landing in Miletus, the messenger or messengers bearing the book of Revelation, would have traveled north to Ephesus, then in a clockwise circle to Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, these weren't just random cities, but as a follower of Christ, you know that. God doesn't do anything unintentionally. He doesn't do anything randomly. He has a purpose and a plan in everything that happens in our life and everything that happens around us. I remember talking with a friend of mine. We both grew up in Augusta. We didn't meet until... We were in college. He went to a different high school than I did growing up. But both of us grew up in families that liked to play golf. And both of us had the privilege growing up of getting to go to the Masters. And one day we were talking about some of the things we had seen there, some of the celebrities and some of the crazy shots and some of that kind of stuff. And he was telling me about one day he was sitting on the old practice tee at the Augusta National. And as he was sitting on the practice tee, there was a player hitting by the name of T.C. Chen. Now, T.C. Chen is a former professional golfer who's from Taiwan. And these guys were watching him hit, and as they were watching him hit, they were in awe of what he was doing. And as my friend watched, he was like, why are they getting so giddy over this? What's going on here? I don't, I don't understand. So it, it, he couldn't stand any longer. He finally said, what do y'all see? And, and they said, watch. Now, he was hitting to a green about 150 yards away, but literally every shot, it was front, back, right, left. Front, back, right, left. He was intentionally hitting every shot to a particular spot on the green. If you're just sitting there not paying attention, you think he's spraying the ball all around, but he's actually hitting front of the green, back of the green, right side of the green, left side of the green, front of the green, back of the green, right side, left, intentionally. It looked like it had no purpose, but it had definite purpose. You may think things are happening randomly in your life sometimes, but God is not a random God. He doesn't waste your time like the salesman who likes to call you during supper. 
God is intentional. God has a purpose, and He's speaking to these seven churches, and we're going to examine each one of those churches and see God's purpose in speaking to those churches. They have an application to us today for sure, but God had a purpose in who He was sending this message to. So we see the author and we see the audience, but next I want you to notice the voice and the vision. Now in verse 10, we learn that the voice speaking to John sounded like a trumpet. Now for those of you who have never heard Doug play a trumpet, Doug plays the trumpet very well. But it, for those of you who have heard, you may have noticed we don't generally have to mic the trumpet. I mean, the trumpet has clarity, it projects. You don't need to mic a trumpet most of the time. You've got to be in a pretty big room to mic a trumpet. That was John's point. This voice was loud, it was clear, it was authoritative. He heard the voice of Jesus. It commanded attention. John, look at what John says about this. When I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe and with a golden sash wrapped around his chest. Now he immediately noticed seven golden lampstands, and in verse 20 tells him that, and us about the fact what these lampstands are for. These seven lampstands represent the seven churches that we just mentioned. Now, notice that they're golden. Why in the world would they be golden? Well, we know gold is a precious metal. It was the most precious metal for them in that day. That tells us that God values the church. The church has a high priority to Him. It is special to Him. These lampstands were gold, and Jesus was willing to give His life for the church and to shed His blood for our sins. You understand that the church is not this building. You are the church. God gave Himself for us. He values us. These were common, oil-filled, portable lamps on a stand, but they were valuable in God's sight. Among those lampstands was one like the Son of Man. Now, I don't have to tell you that this phrase, Son of Man, is a reference to Jesus and how fitting it is to see the glorified Jesus moving among His people, moving among His churches. Jesus wants to do His work through His church, but we have to have sense to get out of the way and to let Him work through us. As Christians, we don't worship a dead prophet or a cold statue. We worship a living God that claimed the victory over death. Jesus is alive and well, therefore we have every reason to worship Him. The robe that's referred to here is the robe of the high priest. And of course, our high priest has on the high priestly garment. The golden sash was worn by the high priest and Christ, the superior high priest, unlike any other, has on that golden sash. He is not of the order of Aaron. There will be no successor to him. He is the final high priest. He is the, of the order of Melchizedek, and he is eternally our high priest. Whenever there is a change in leadership in an organization or a nation, there can be uncertainty. There will likely be some practices that are changed, some goals that are different. We, we are serving, however, an unchanging God, and we have an unchanging high priest. He is not temperamental. What pleases him today will please him 10,000 years from now. That is something to take joy in to know that he is not a fickle or temperamental God. He is a loving and gracious God that loves his bride, the church. Now I want you to look at verses 14 and 15 again. The hair of his head was white as wool, white as snow, and his eyes like a fiery flame. His feet were like fine bronze as it is fired in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of cascading waters. Now I'll have to admit I like the white hair part. Pretty sure it's godly. <laughs> I have to confess, however, that the Greek is not really speaking to the color of the hair. The idea that's really being represented here in the Greek has more to do with bright, blazing, or brilliant. The Ancient of Days in Daniel 7, 9 is very similar in language to what's being used here. This affirms Christ's deity and it symbolizes His eternal, glorious, holy truthfulness. Jesus is the truth. You know John 14, 6. I don't have to repeat it for you. Jesus 
is the truth. His truth is eternal. It is immortal. It is unchanging. What God says is true will always be true. This world can do whatever it wants to, but God's truth is still the truth. Even if we put our hands over our ears and act like a three-year-old and just start screaming, no, 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 no. It's not going to change it. God's truth is still the truth. What God calls sin today is sin for eternity, but Jesus Christ paid the price for it so that we could be forgiven. In, that, in those verses, we see the phrase, his eyes like a fiery flame. This clues us into the fact that he is infallible. He has an infallible, penetrating gaze. He sees into the very heart of man. You know, the writer of Hebrews even speaks to that, talk about the, the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to penetrate in a way God sees into our lives, even into the marrow of our bones. God sees into the core of who we are. Now, i got to be honest, that immediately causes two thoughts, and both of them begin the same way. (laughs) Woe is me. Woe is me, first of all, because God knows everything about me. He knows how wicked and sinful I am. He knows my every awful thought. Woe is me. But woe is me that the same God who knows that about me loved me enough to die on a cross for me and loves me in spite of knowing those things about me. That causes my cup to overflow. That causes me to say, thank you, Jesus, for your amazing grace. I don't deserve that kind of love. I don't deserve for him to love me in spite of what he knows about me, and yet he does. Now, one thing I want to add to this, because his gaze is perfect, because his gaze can see to the very heart and core, for those you look around at and think, boy, I can't stand the fact they're getting away with that. Well, first of all, you need to repent for your attitude. (laughs) But secondly, let me assure you, they are not getting away with that. God knows the heart. He sees. And the Word of God promises us very clearly that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, as many times as I've looked at that, Doug, it struck me about two weeks ago When it says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, I think about that, I've always thought about that individually. But there's going to be a day when everybody is doing it in chorus, in unison. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Whether they place their trust in Him or not, they will still call Him Lord. But next I want you to see His feet were like fine bronze as it is fired in a furnace. Now this is a reference to his authority, to his judgment. The king's throne in in that day was always elevated so that whenever you came into the king's presence, you would literally be looking at at the king's feet. You would be beneath the king, below the king. Christ is the head of the church and he will judge the church for whether or not she has been faithful to his call or not. He is on the throne and unlike earthly kings, his judgments are perfect. And as we'll see in his examination of these seven churches, he knows the truth about his bride and he points out what needs to be fixed, what needs to be corrected. He points out where we're not honoring him and calls us to repentance. We need to be the body of Christ that he would have us to be and honor him in what we do. The last phrase of verse 15 says, and his voice, and his voice like the sound of cascading waters. That's an obvious change from the trumpet. But don't, be, don't misunderstand here. Don't be confused by that because it is still powerful. His voice is powerful. For those of you who love the beach, you know the sound of the waves. If you've ever been to a beach where you had to park in a parking lot where you couldn't quite see the beach and you maybe had to walk across a dune to the beach, you can still hear the ocean. You can still hear, hear the water from that parking lot. Last year when Janice and I went to Niagara Falls, our hotel was literally about a block from the falls. You could stand in the parking lot or you could stand on the sidewalk of that hotel and you could hear the falls. That's what I imagine when I think about God's voice. It's a commanding presence. I don't think it hurts the ears, but it's a commanding presence. That's what John is describing to us here. 
So we see how John described the voice. I want us to take a look at what he has to say about the vision in verse 16. He had seven stars in his right hand. A sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was shining like the sun at full strength. Now, that's quite a vision. That's kind of hard to wrap our minds around because that's not like something we're accustomed to seeing. But we learn from verse 20 that those seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And much discussion has been had about what the meaning of angels is here. And the most logical understanding of this rests in messenger because that word angelos can mean messenger. And Christ had the messengers or the pastors of these seven churches in His right hand. Angels in the sense of those in heaven, those angels that God that work for God, they're not in leadership of the churches, so it just follows context here that this would be referring to the pastors. God has called pastors to be His under-shepherds for the church. I have a responsibility before God and before you, but my greatest responsibility is to Him, not to you. I... I would rather be obedient to Him than to make you happy. That's what He's called me to. The sharp double-edged sword reminds us that Christ will defend His church. His Word will expose the lies of the enemy against the church. It's a shame today that we have so many news outlets, but we can't trust them to simply give us the facts. When you can literally pull up hard data, hard, clear data, and it contradicts what the news is putting out, then you know you're not getting the facts. Unfortunately, there are those who listen to those outlets and just assume that everything they're being told is the truth. Christ knows our hearts. He knows those who have lied about His people. He knows those who have lied about His church. And He doesn't mince words. He's not confused about the truth at all. He will deal with those that have lied against His church. Finally, even in His face, His glory and holiness shine like the sun at full strength. You know, I don't care how good your sunglasses are, you can't look directly at the sun. Maybe one of those welder's helmets, maybe you can do it through that, but just sunglasses, you can't endure that. You can't take that. It is just too bright for our eyes to be able to endure, but the glory of Jesus, the glory of Jesus outshines the sun and yet we'll be able to look on it one day. My eyes are not fit for that yet, but one day in His presence they will be. His light is perfect light. It exposes darkness. So we've seen the author and the audience. We've seen the voice and the vision. But thirdly, I want you to look at the response and the reassurance. The response and the reassurance. Look at verses 17 and 18 again. When I saw Him, I fell at His feet like a dead man. He laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. It is overwhelming to think of what that moment will be like when we see Jesus for the first time. Even though our vision might be Different from what John is describing here, I have a feeling our response will be much the same. We're going to fall like dead men before Him. The overwhelming sense of His glory and majesty suddenly thrust upon us will likely be too much to take in easily. I believe we'll fall at His feet and take in His glory and greatness and have a a rush of gratitude for all that He has done for us. However, You've got to notice the response. Jesus put his hand on John and quickly told him, don't be afraid. The same God who can speak the worlds into existence, the same God who can speak to the winds and the waves and calm them, that same God puts his hand on John's shoulder and says, don't be afraid. I I, I just got a strong feeling here. Fear left John. In that moment, the presence of God is overwhelming, but the peace of God brings calm no matter what. 
Jesus wants us to know Him in His fullness. He wants us to know Him as we have been known. And one day we will know Him as we have been known. But He doesn't want us to be afraid in His presence. After all, we're going to spend eternity with Him. In comforting John, he identifies himself as the I Am. This is the Greek ego emi. And it has the covenant. It is the covenant name of God. And these are the same words, ironically, that he uses in Matthew 14, 27, when Jesus comes to the disciples on the water and he says, it is I. It's the same words in the Greek. Then Jesus reminds us that he is the first and the last. We've already discussed the fact that he was the active part of the Godhead in creation. And he existed before time as we, as we know it, and he will exist after time as we know it ends. He is eternal and he is unchanging. Verse 18 simply reminds us that He was the one that had been crucified and died physically for our sins, but He is alive. And He has claimed the victory over death and Hades. He literally holds the keys and those who cry out to Him for salvation find it in Him and only in Him. The Word of God says there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Jesus Christ. You want to enter the kingdom of heaven, there's only one door, there's only one way, it's through Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you've never placed your faith in Christ, if you're watching online, if you've never placed your faith in Christ, Jesus is the only way to find forgiveness and eternal life. The good news is He's the only way you need. And He's done everything necessary for you to be able to be forgiven. Would you just ask His forgiveness right now? Would you just... Say, God, I'm a sinner. And listen, it's not about the prayer you pray. It's about your heart and attitude in it. God, I'm a sinner. I need you to forgive me. Would you forgive me of my sins? And I invite you into my life. It doesn't have to be that exact prayer. It just has to be that you admit that you're a sinner and you need God's forgiveness. And He and He alone can forgive you. And He will. The good news is when you do that, the Word of God tells us the Holy Spirit comes to live in your life. You have God's presence in you. This power and this majesty that I've talked about just in this little section of the Revelation, that power is in us because of the Holy Spirit within us. I'm afraid too many times, as believers, we do an awful lot to quench that power. We don't tap into the Holy Spirit within us like we could. But if you've never trusted Christ, I pray you do that today. Christian, I pray that you and I would live as though we actually serve the God that's described right here in this Revelation text we just looked at. Voice like a trumpet, voice like cascading waves, a tongue like a double-edged sword, eyes that are able to see to the very heart of who we are. May we live in such a way that we always remember He is all-powerful and He can provide anything and everything we need to accomplish His work. I realize for some of you, though, you come here, you've been walking with the Lord, but still you have burden and you have need in your life. I want to make sure you know this and understand this. God has not forgotten you. And God is more than able to see you through whatever it is you're facing right now. But I want to encourage you to let go of it and trust it to God. Give it to Him. Don't try to carry it on your own. You weren't meant to carry it on your own. He will strengthen you. He will provide for your need. Maybe the step you need to take today is just to come and find a place at this altar. Man, praise the Lord, our altar is plenty big enough to social distance. <laughs> but I have a feeling in the presence of God, we don't need to worry about that. We just need to be obedient. Whatever you need to do to honor God during this invitation time, let Him have His way. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for Your love, for Your amazing grace. God, I thank You for this glimpse into Your glory. I realize John and his humanness did the best he could to describe Your glory, and I know, Lord, it's so much more than we can even begin to wrap our minds around. I pray for us as followers that we would truly Realize that 
We serve an awesome, mighty, majestic God. And we have victory because you have already won the victory. Lord, I pray for those who don't yet know you, who haven't yet asked your forgiveness and trusted in you. Pray right now they'd have the courage to do that. Just to admit to themselves that they're sinners in need of a Savior. God, have your way in our hearts. Whatever burdens or concerns, God, I pray we'd lay those at your feet right now and and allow you to do the work you already want to do in our lives. It's in your precious and powerful name we pray these things. Amen. We're going to stand as we sing our hymn of invitation. Whatever God's leading you to do right now, let him have his way. Without Him, how lost I would be.